Wood Christian Fellowship's weekly podcast. Hope you really enjoy today's sermon, and I hope it really blesses you. Come to you, whatever condition we're in, and you'll always welcome us with open arms. As we open your word now, we know that you're welcoming us with open arms again. Pray you'd open our hearts to what you have in store for us, that we'd get excited by what we see. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of weeks ago, there were two prophecies in our service here on Sunday morning, one by Mark and one by Jonathan, and they dovetailed in together really well. And basically what they were saying was, Don't think that your life is over or that you're too damaged to get it back on track. Don't consign God to a box. Open your heart to him and let him write your song. Let him write your song. And I've been thinking about that and a few other things and putting it together. Um, I'd like to borrow a phrase from Judges 17. Israel was in a mess and they, it's, the scripture says they were in a mess because everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. Everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. And I bet you that we all like to think that because we believe in Jesus and we follow his teachings, that our beliefs and our lifestyle are different from our workmates or our classmates or people we bump into in the supermarket. But are we really that much different Or are we like the Christians that are described in Ephesians 4.14? I'll read a verse or two before just to get the context. Starting at verse 11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This is the verse I want to look at. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Are we like that? Are we tossed around, blown about by by society? Do we really really believe the Bible and trust it with our lifestyle? Do we really believe the Bible and trust it with our very lives? Or do we want to write our own song or have it written for us by society, by these cunning cunning words that we just talked about? According to recent news and articles that you pick up, it seems that society thinks that we should be having more gay sex but not so many legal highs that we should be eating more fish but catching less fish that we should bear our souls on Facebook but have total control of our own privacy that we should condemn Syria for gassing its people and yet we're still bashing our own kids at an alarming rate so do you ever feel pressurised to change your views on issues, by, by society, by, by what your workmates say. What do you think the church, the Orthodox Church, 50 years ago thought about homosexuality or abortion or recreational drugs compared to what it thinks about, thinks about those issues today? And what's it going to think about those issues in 50 years' time? I find that a bit scary, actually. We think and say that we base our beliefs and lives on the Bible, but the mainstream Orthodox church theology seems to be changing. So how does that affect how we view the scriptures? The Bible is a collection of how many books? 66 books. We all remember Chuck Missler. And how many authors, 40-something, I can't remember what the something is, who are inspired by God? It's the historical account of God's dealing with Israel, and it's it's his heart for humanity written down 
on paper. I think there's probably three broad views on scripture. One is some people say that it's just history and that we can treat it as a history book. And it does have lots of history in it, but that's to show that they were real people and real events that really happened. And because it's there as history doesn't mean that we have to follow it. So we don't have to worry about whether we should mount the heads of defeated kings on poles or whether we should use hungry bears to discipline cheeky children. Um, just because it's there as history doesn't mean we need to copy it. There's another view of scripture that says, yes, it was inspired, but it was written for the Jews and it's not applicable to us today. Now, imagine that you were God writing the Bible today. What would you write about in the New Testament? You'd write about current issues. You wouldn't write about some stuff that was 2,000 years ago or something that was way in the future. You'd write about current issues. And that's what God did when he inspired the authors of the New Testament. They wrote about current issues. It doesn't mean that they're not relevant to us today, though. I mean, the issues of the day then, a lot of it was about sex, and it still is today. Nothing's changed. Um, what about women covering their heads? I don't see any hats on heads here today. So clearly something's different about that situation. And what does that scripture mean to us today about women covering their heads in church? I ha Actually, I honestly have no idea. Um, but it was there, and... I have to trust it was there for a reason. It was a current topic of the day. Um, there's lots in the Bible then about how we talk to each other, how we treat each other, be kind, encouraging, etc. It's all still totally relevant to us today. There's a, a third view of Scripture which says that it's all totally inspired by God. We should believe and act on every single word of it. And I'm probably at that end of the spectrum but I think we do need to understand what it actually means before we say, yep, this is what you apply. I mean the head covering. It means something, but completely different than what it meant to the Jews back then. So we need to be wise about what it actually means for us today. So if you go through the Bible and you toss out all the history bits, and then you throw out all the bits you don't understand, and there's some bits that, seem pretty mean and nasty, don't they? So I'll toss those out as well because they're actually just too hard. And you follow what's left. You're actually not believing the scriptures at all. You're putting yourself in a position where you're saying, that's good, that's not. I'll reject this, I'll accept that. And so you're, you're actually putting yourself in a position of judging the scriptures and deciding what's right and what's wrong. Where... And so you're putting yourself above the scriptures. And as we read it, I think that we should be humbly asking God to show us what it means and submitting ourselves to it rather than picking and choosing or else thinking we've got the answer before we read it and then looking for the answer in the scriptures to defend the view that, we, that we've come to. If you don't understand parts of it, that's fine. There's huge chunks I don't understand. I don't pretend to understand them. So then you say, God, show me, rather than it's rubbish. Or it's, it's, I'm not going to believe it. Don't understand it, not a problem. Ask God. What does the Bible say about laptops, tablets, iPads, and smartphones? Absolutely nothing. Could you imagine Jeremiah when he was hiding down the bottom of the well under all that hay and mud? thinking about laptops or smartphones when he was prophesying? Or Ezekiel, when he was talking about wheels within wheels, was he thinking about a hard drive? I very much doubt it. But the Bible talks about gossip and kindness and talking, and all of those principles are totally relevant to how we use iPads and smartphones, and the principles are exactly the same. So... In a sense, the Bible does, does talk about how we should use laptops and how we should use smartphones. What does the Bible say about marriage? Suddenly that's all confusing because two weeks ago, a month ago, the definition changed in New Zealand. 
And so now we have to define what we mean by marriage before we even talk about it. What does the Bible say about tithing? Now, I'd like to ask an honest question. Does anyone here really, really deep down enjoy paying for something when you can get it for free? None of us really likes parting with our money. That's an underlying bias that we have. When I became a Christian, it was tithing. You all tithed. There was no debate about it. You tithed. Over the last 30 years, that position has kind of changed where our oh, tithing's Old Testament, really, and you don't have to do that. So in the process of that change, if you come to the point where you don't actually give anything because you've thrown out tithing, then you've actually thrown out a great principle that's in the Bible about generosity and giving, and you've thrown out the, the baby with the bathwater because our underlying bias is we don't like giving away money. So if we can justify the scriptures to not give anything, we, we've put our, our interpretation on the Bible rather than just humbly coming before God and saying, what do you say about money and how I should handle it? So, and, and I think it actually says that God should have access to all of our money, not just 10%. Um, but it's not legalistically 10%. So with our bias looking at the scriptures, we can, we can twist it and distort it. What does the Bible say about homosexuality? Again, I think there's a lot of Christian apologists studying the Bible, trying to come to a position where they can accept it rather than just say it's wrong, which is what it would seem on a, a straightforward reading of Scripture. And there's been a huge progressive agenda here. I can clearly remember when homosexuality was made legal and the representatives were reassuring us Christians, saying all we want is to make legal what happens between two consenting adults in their own bedroom. That's it. There is no other agenda. Biggest lie ever, because it has just moved and moved and moved ever since. That was just the thin end of the wedge. And, and it's just, it just keeps changing. What about euthanasia? Um, if your parent or your spouse is dying in agony, isn't it the kind thing to do to end their suffering? All sounds great. But again, there's a very thin end of a, of a wedge here because as our population gets older, there's going to be more and more old people who are sick and dying and less and less people to support them with their taxes. So the problem is going to get bigger. And in Holland now, I was reading in a medical journal, if you're elderly or got a terminal illness, you can see a doctor today, sign the papers, by tomorrow you'll be dead. It's that quick and that easy. What does the Bible think about euthanasia? Do you know? Do you have a view? Are you going to let it be formed by what happens in the newspapers and TV over the next several years? Now, everything I've just said about the Bible, I believe is true. But I think we need to take it a whole level deeper than that. You can study the Bible exhaustively. You can put it into practice. But in the process of doing that, if you don't actually get to know Jesus Christ, you've actually missed the whole point of it. The, the, the Bible isn't actually the answer. It's a bit like going into a restaurant, looking at the menu, going through everything. Oh, that's an awesome meal. Oh, look at that. And then you walk out without getting eating a meal. If you just read the Bible and put it into practice and don't meet Jesus, you've eaten the menu and f forgotten the meal. So the whole point of the Bible is to actually get to know God. And I guess one way of thinking about this is um, as, as parents... Have you ever dropped your kids off at a friend's place for the weekend? And I'm sure you all, as you're dropping them off, they get out of the car, you say, have a good time and take your shoes off when you get to the door and remember to clean your teeth and don't pull their cat's tail and don't fight with their kids and be, light, be polite to their parents and eat what's offered to you and, and especially don't burp like you do sometimes in the middle of dinner and don't, don't drink their, their parents' alcohol. Do you do, you do that? You've... 
you don't, do you? You've got better ways to spend an hour or a life. So you'll, you'll say, have a good time and be good. And that's all you need to say because you know each other. You know them, they know you. They, they know what you mean by saying be good. And so it's, about, it's not about legalistically following thousands and thousands of rules or commands that you can find in the Bible, but as you read that, all that stuff, are you getting to know the Lord Jesus? Do you know him? Does he know you? So the proper use of the Bible isn't to go through tossing out chunks and picking and choosing what suits, because that's actually a really arrogant position, but to humbly read the scriptures and ask the Holy Spirit to show us how we can get to know God better here in Inglewood in 2013 and let God change you. Will you let him write your song? Will you trust him to write your song? Or are you going to write your own? So do we trust him to write our song, like the prophecy of a few weeks ago? We think we have an agenda for our lives. Will you submit it before the Lord as we, as we read this menu and get to know the Lord Jesus through it? It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Summing all of that up, it's just saying, do we know the Lord Jesus? Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every kind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. So are we basing our lives on what we think is right for us or do we trust the Lord to do it? Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you've given us your precious scriptures. Thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us to truth, to the Father. And I pray that as we walk in this world, as we submit ourselves to you, that we're going to have opinions and views and lifestyles that are contrary and unpopular. But are we going to be infants tossed around or are we going to be rock solid based on the Lord Jesus Christ? I pray that you would show us truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So if any of you have got areas where you're wrestling, where you think, oh, I just don't think the scripture's right there, maybe you'd like to pray with one or two and, and submit it to the Lord, ask him to show you. It's absolutely fine to say, I don't know. But to pick and choose and decide for yourself is where we, that's not our job. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast of Inglewood Christian Fellowship in Taranaki, New Zealand. Call by and listen in again next week. God bless. Bye-bye.